there anybody that thinks teachers or textbooks should be allowed to use outdated or false information just to get students to believe a particular theory? No, no? okay. Anybody here that thinks teachers that lie, deliberately lie, should be fired? Yes. Okay, fair enough. Now, anybody here that thinks textbooks with lies should be banned or the lies torn out? Yes. Sure, okay, good, just so we're all on the same page here. Now, it's always amazed me <clears throat> how two people can look at the same thing and come to opposite conclusions of what they are seeing. Two people can look at Grand Canyon. One of them believes in evolution. He looks at the canyon and says, wow, look what the Colorado River did for millions and millions of years. The Bible believing Christian stands there, looks at the same canyon and says, wow, look what the flood did in about 30 minutes. <laughs> now, how was that canyon formed anyway? This textbook says over millions of years, the Colorado River has carved the Grand Canyon from solid rock. Now just slow down a minute. Kids, it is a fact Grand Canyon exists. How many have been to Grand Canyon? I taught earth science, studied Grand Canyon avidly. I like Grand Canyon, beautiful place. Big hole in the ground. Now there are two interpretations of how it got there. The evolutionists have an interpretation and so do the creationists. The evolutionist is gonna tell you that canyon formed slowly by a little bit of water and lots of time, millions of years. The creationist is gonna tell you, oh, the canyon formed quickly by lots of water and a little bit of time. The guys who believe in evolution are continually trying to erase the line between their interpretation and the fact column, and they want you to somehow think that what they interpret as evidence is now part of the fact. You gotta really watch them on this. They're pretty slick. This textbook author does it just blatantly. He says, the Colorado River has cut through layer upon layer of rock over millions of years. Now just hold on a minute. I was in a debate one time and this atheist said, Hovind, you're so dumb. Don't you know it took millions of years to make Grand Canyon? I said, well, sir, I taught her science for years. I really enjoy studying Grand Canyon. I said, did you know if you built a dam across Grand Canyon, uh, that would take a lot of dirt, by the way, but if you did, a huge lake would fill in behind it. Did you know some of the water from Montana drains through the Grand Canyon? It's a huge drainage area. I said, sir, did you know that in between these two red lines is what we call the snow line. There's a ridge right there. The Grand Canyon enters at the far right over here. The elevation of the river at that, at that point is 2,800 feet above sea level. The river flows downhill for 270 miles and comes out the other side. And in between, while the river's flowing down, the ground is rising up and then slowly coming back down. It is so wide, 270 miles, that you don't notice it until you get way back and look at it from a satellite. But if you look at it in a cross section, this schematic shows the difference here. The river enters right here and flows downhill and comes out the other side. It's actually going through a giant ridge, 270 miles long. At the highest point of the ridge, the river's at about 1,800 foot elevation, so it's nearly a one mile drop down into the canyon. Really big hole in the ground. I said, now sir, there are a couple things you ought to consider about Grand Canyon. I said, did you know <clears throat> the top of Grand Canyon is higher than the bottom? <clears throat> he said, uh, yes. I said, sir, did you know the river runs through the bottom? He said, yes. I said, sir, did you know the top is higher than where the river enters the canyon by over 4,000 feet? I said, sir, did you know that rivers don't flow uphill? <laughs> I said, sir, did you know there is no delta? Nobody knows where the mud is that got washed out of there, but it's probably out in the Pacific Ocean. They can't find the delta for Grand Canyon. There is no possible way that river made that canyon. Grand Canyon is quite obviously a washed out spillway. There used to be two big lakes, Grand Lake and Hopi Lake, and they got too full one day, who knows when. I suspect shortly after the flood, Maybe a few hundred years later, the ice caps melted or something, and the lakes got too full, and the water went over the top while the ground was still relatively soft. Within the first few hundred years, washed out that canyon in a hurry. There are still beaches where the lakes used to be. They call them Grand Lake and Hopi Lake. The lake is long gone, but you can still see the beach line where the lake used to be. Grand Canyon is a washed out spillway, folks. The water got too deep, went over the top, and washed out that whole region in a real big hurry. So when they tell you it took millions of years, they're lying to you. It did not. It's not geophysically possible. If you look at the way most rivers come together, almost all rivers join at what are called acute angles, less than 90 degrees. You can look at any map of the world, nearly all rivers come together and keep going the same general direction. 
Well, if you look at Grand Canyon, the rivers on the left, lower left side join at acute angles, normal river pattern. If you look at the right side, the rivers go backwards and run into the channel and turn around and come back the other way. This is evidence of a big lake that is draining. Any farmer that's ever built a dam to hold water to feed his cows or something or water his cows will tell you, once the water goes over the top of the dam, it can wash it out in a hurry. And it doesn't wash away the whole dam, it washes one slot, wherever the water finds the weakest point. So the water's running backwards off the dam to hit the lowest channel, turn around, come back the other way. Grand Canyon was not formed by the Colorado River, folks. Grand Canyon was formed by a flood. A lot of water with a little bit of time. Textbooks say the layers are different ages. I'm sorry, that's baloney. Now, Charlie Darwin didn't like round numbers. He said the weld-in deposits are 306,662,400 years old. How he knows is anybody's guess. But here they are telling the kids the layers are different ages, and yet all over the world, petrified trees are found, like this one, standing up, connecting different rock layers. Now, if you have a petrified tree standing up, running through multiple rock layers, I don't think it's common sense to say the layers are different ages. Not by much, anyway. I mean, how long can a dead tree stand there before it falls down? Five years, 10 years, 20 years, 5,000 years? I doubt that. And yet, petrified trees in the poly, they're called polystrata fossils, going through multiple layers. They're very common. Hundreds and hundreds have been found. It would only take one to prove the point. <clears throat> But hundreds have been found, petrified, standing up. In central Alabama, there's a large coal mine where they found all kinds of petrified trees standing up. Now, the kids have been taught for years that those two layers of coal, called the Mary Lee and the Blue Creek Formation, are different ages by millions of years. And yet, when you get all the fossils together, they label them, sample A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. You can put it together and figure out and prove positively the Mary Lee and the Blue Creek had to form within a few weeks or months of each other. That's exactly what you'd get in a flood. We cover more on that on video number six about the flood, what caused the coal seams during the flood. Here's some from Cookville, Tennessee. Petrified trees standing up, running through multiple layers. Joggins, Nova Scotia is famous for its petrified trees in the vertical position. Most of these pictures are on our website, drdino.com. We've got a piece of petrified wood in our museum running through 12 different layers of slate. And they're gonna tell you in school, each layer of slate represents a different season. That's 12 years. I'm sorry, that's not true. That represents movement of the water and separation of the particles by density or something like that. We get into that in video six. So don't let them tell you the layers are different ages. Sometimes trees are found petrified upside down, running through multiple rock layers. Now we really have a problem. I've thought about this one until my brain hurts. As far as I can figure this out, the evolutionist only has two ways to solve this. He can say the trees stood upright for millions of years while the layers for slowly formed around them. Mm, I find that one hard to believe. Or he can say the trees grew through hundreds of feet of solid rock looking for sunlight. <laughs> There's a third way to solve this. Maybe those trees were buried in a big flood. Mm. How fast was that calf going? Mm. <laughs> Might be two ways to look at this, you know, yeah. When Mount St. Helens blew its top, it blew thousands of trees down into Spirit Lake. Over 20,000 trees are, have already sunk to the bottom and are stuck in the mud at the bottom of Spirit Lake. Many thousands of them are standing up in the vertical position. And those trees are going to petrify. They're already beginning to petrify. It does not take long for things to petrify.
the earth is rounder and smoother than the cue ball. If you shrank it down to the size of a 12-inch globe, you probably couldn't even find Mount Everest. They always exaggerate them for the globe so you can feel the bump on there, but that is greatly exaggerated compared to the actual size of these mountains. They're, the earth would be extremely smooth at this scale right here. Um, you get out in space and look back at the earth, you can't see Mount Everest, you can't see any mountains whatsoever. It's just real, real round. Okay, so I think the smoothness of the earth compared to its size is something people don't comprehend because we live on it and we're this big and compared to the giant earth, but actually a five-mile mountain on an 8,000-mile earth is nothing. And if you lowered the oceans just a few hundred feet, a lot of things are connected. If you raise the ocean just 10 percent, all of Florida is gone. Half of Texas is underwater just by raising the oceans 10 percent. The oceans average 12,000 feet deep. So the water during, during, the flood, during the end of the flood would run off into these holes, carving the erosion features that we see all over the world. And some of it basically is, is real close to flat. For instance, the Mississippi River is a huge river, but it only drops about 1,000 feet, you know, the width of my property. Uh, New Orleans is 670 miles lower than Minneapolis. New Orleans is right on the, actually below sea level a few feet. Now, the Mississippi River runs from Minneapolis right down to New Orleans. It's 1,150 miles, which means since it runs from Minneapolis to New Orleans, 1,150 miles, but it only drops 670 feet. That's seven inches of drop per mile. The Mississippi has to, has to flow a mile in order to drop seven inches. That's called a very low gradient stream, just not much slope to it. Um, that, that, what happens in those situations, almost always the river ends up looping back and forth, creating these loops. Now, the textbooks will say that these looping rivers are old age. Well, it could be, or it could be that they are simply low gradient. The Grand Canyon could not possibly have been formed by the river. We covered that on seminar part four, because the top of Grand Canyon is 4,000 feet higher than where the river enters the canyon. The Colorado River did not form that canyon. That formed as a result of a giant lake draining called Lake uh, Grand Lake or Hopi Lake. Textbooks often say Grand Canyon is puzzling. Because it loops back and forth, has the loops and meanders like low gradient streams do, but it also has the steep sides. Rivers often loop back and forth if they're on relatively flat ground like the Mississippi, but steep sides indicate very fast moving, high gradient streams, or you know, steep ground, fast moving. Well, Grand Canyon and a lot of these canyons out west have both features, the loops and the steep sides. And so the textbooks will say, wow, this is puzzling, I wonder how it did that. Well, they're looking at it as slow, gradual erosion is the problem. You get a flood, you get this kind of runoff just in a few minutes. We have a flood demonstration tank here at Dinosaur Adventure Land, you can see, um, showing how you can make features just like this in a few, in a few seconds, actually, uh, just by letting the water run through the sand. So I think the best way to explain Grand Canyon and all the features is there was a catastrophe, a disaster. Now, it seems to be anathema these days for modern scientists to talk about catastrophic things forming the features of the earth. They would rather talk about long, slow, gradual processes. But the evidence is overwhelming. This place was, uh, the features were shaped by a catastrophe. Earthquakes can certainly rearrange the real estate in a hurry. In Alaska, 1964, they had an earthquake that lifted sections of the ground up 60 and 70 feet. I was up there at Earthquake Park in Alaska, preaching at a church up there, and you can see places where they've got a park name for it where the ground just dropped away, I think, 60 or 70 feet in a few seconds. I stayed in a hotel. I'm up on the 14th or 15th floor in this one hotel. I said, hey, where was the earthquake fault line? They said, oh, about 10 feet away from this building back in 1964. The ground just dropped off, and so they smoothed it out and planted grass, made a hill there where it used to be just you know, level ground. Uh, one disaster can certainly change things. Mount St. Helens showed us that. In 1980, Mount St. Helens erupted, and it uh, blew all kinds of mud down into the valley. As the volcano began to explode, the north slope slid down uh, very rapidly, probably 100 miles an hour, uncorking the steam coming out of this volcano that was boiling hot steam and ash came out. Volcanoes produce a lot of water and steam, by the way. This ash cloud went shooting across the countryside and did enormous damage. As the ash came across, it, it just, the volcano killed about 60 people that they know of. I'm not sure exactly how many died, but the ash went every place. Covered up cars, it went clear. Some of it landed in New York City, but the basic ash cloud, you can see it right here on the map or here on this color coded area, they got up to a half inch in the yellow areas, really thick up to five inches in the red areas. My sister lived just a few miles north of Mount St. Helens, about 40 miles, when the volcano blew up. And they got all kinds of ash in their yard. Of course, it plugs your filters on everything, your furnace, air conditioning filters, your car filters. Uh, yeah, everything gets plugged up. 
and it just makes a muddy mess as they have to try to wash away the ash. And Mount St. Helens is a, was a tiny volcano by volcano standards. This chart shows Mount St. Helens on the far right. It ejected about one cubic kilometer of ash. Some of the larger volcanic eruptions in the past were huge compared to that one. So we're talking a tiny volcano. But even this tiny volcano taught us some amazing things about how a disaster can rearrange the real estate. For instance, moving ash is like any moving fluid. It can automatically sort into layers. As the mud flowed down the volcano side, it was going extremely rapidly, and this boiling hot mud covered up huge chunks of ice. Here's a truck buried up to the cab in mud from this boiling hot mud flowing down the side of this volcano. Next to a mobile home here, it's got buried. Uh, there's an uh, A-frame house there that you can go. They were just ready to move into it when the volcano erupted. Mud came down the valley and filled the A-frame house up to the second floor. You walk in on the second floor, they, they gave up on the house. It's uh, beyond hope. A friend of mine who works up there at uh, creationism.org uh, uh, interviewed uh, Lloyd Anderson, who said, uh, Mount St. Helens blew enough material out for everybody on Earth to have a ton of it. Every human being on the planet could own a ton. They could fill a 10 cubic yard dump truck every second, 24 hours a day for 600 years. That's from the mud that was blown out of that volcano. Some of this mud, it's called a pyroclastic flow, slid down the valley and blocked off the Toodle River. It covered up chunks of ice that had been blown off the volcano. There were chunks of ice as big as this room blown off the volcano because it used to be covered by huge glaciers. And this ice was blown off in an explosion and then hot mud flowed over the top. When you get hot mud on top of ice, you're going to create a problem because ice melts to water and then turns to steam. Now, when it melts to water, it shrinks about 12%. When water turns to steam, it expands 1,700 times. And there's nothing that's going to stop it. That's how steam engines work. You know, the water turns to steam and enormous power pushes on the piston and turns the train or whatever you're going to do, turns the paddle wheel boat. So the water underneath from these ice cubes is now turning to flashing to steam under the hot mud and it actually exploded huge steam explosions took place all around mount st helens where these ice blocks had been covered by by mud then it settled in of course and made these big erosion pits as everything was blown out and then it settled back down all around the erosion pit you see enormous erosion marks you see canyons and gullies and rills and I guarantee some science teacher is going to take his students down here someday and say, boys and girls, this took millions of years to form all this erosion. When we know for sure, it took a matter of a few moments to form all that. The Toodle River was actually blocked off for 22 months. The river had no way to get to the ocean, no established pathway. Then in May 18th, when the river was buried up to 100 feet deep, it covered Spirit Lake. It buried all the drainage patterns, most of them, for 23 square miles, and it plugged up the valley's mouth. For 22 months, the water had no established path to the lower waterway. Then on March 19, 1982, 22 months later, an eruption melted a large snowpack that had accumulated in the crater over the winter. The waters mixed with loose material on the slopes of the mountain, creating an enormous mud flow. In nine hours, while no one watched, it was overnight, the mud flow carved an integrated system of drainages over much of the valley and reopened the way to the Pacific Ocean. The drainages included at least three canyons 100 feet deep. One was nicknamed the Little Grand Canyon of the Toodle because it's a 140th scale model of the Grand Canyon formed in nine hours or less. You know, during the nighttime shift is all they know what happened. Could have been at one hour. What happened was the mud flowed across, stopped off the Toodle River. Now, they call it a river. I would call it a creek. It's, you know, about 15 feet wide. Where I come from, that's a creek. But where they come from, I guess that's a river. But it actually blocked, dammed off this river. Once it got to the top, though, it overflowed the dam and began carving out erosion features. There's a canyon 1,000 feet wide, 140 feet deep, that was carved just in a few hours that one evening. At the bottom is a little tiny river flowing through there called the Toodle River. You can't even see it on this map. Once water starts going over a dam, erosion can be enormous, uh, can do enormous damage, and it can be very rapid. Ask any farmer that's ever had water get too deep in his dam that he keeps to keep the water to feed his cows, or water his cows, he can tell you, well, it can do a lot of damage in a hurry. When they went down into that brand new canyon formed by Mount St. Helens, they found strata on the side, layers of rock. There's, I flew down inside this system of uh, caves and uh, uh, canyons just a few years ago when I was up there. A friend of mine and I, we rented a small plane and flew down around there and got photographs of all this. Uh, if you go down inside there, you'll see the sides of it have layers, just like Grand Canyon. There's a person at the bottom for scale. You can see these layers uh, are all bedded horizontally. They're all flat on top of each other, just like pages in a book or pancakes on a plate, 
And some, some scientists someday is going to say, oh, boys and girls, each of these layers is a different age, which is baloney. We know that it all formed quickly, and less than two years later, the canyon was cut quickly. All of this happened because of a disaster. And in Noah's flood, you would get the same features on a much larger scale. There's a little tiny river at the bottom of this massive canyon, and if you think that river made that canyon, you're mistaken. And there's a little tiny river called the Colorado River at the bottom of Grand Canyon. And if you think that river made that canyon, you are just as mistaken. Grand Canyon had to be formed by a disaster, a catastrophe, a big lake overflowed. We cover all that on video number four. Um, the trees that were blown down by Mount St. Helens were pretty incredible. I mean, thousands and thousands, if not maybe millions of trees were blown down all around Spirit Lake and all around this area. About 150 square miles was just flattened. Looks like toothpicks with all the branches and leaves stripped off. They went in to, to log these trees. They got as many as they could. I mean, these are massive trees they're taking out of there. You can see some next to the semis here. As they logged these trees to bring them out, they hauled out hundreds and hundreds of truckloads of trees and got way less than 10% of the available logs. It just they couldn't get it out fast enough. The Spirit Lake was so plugged with logs, you could actually walk across the water. There were 2,000 acres of floating wood. None of it grew there. All of this uh, material was blown in by the volcano. And it drifts back and forth. Here it is, 2003, as we tape this. There are still logs from 23 years ago, still today, floating in Spirit Lake. Many logs began to float in the upright position. The root end got heavier and went down. Generally, it would be the case. I guess suppose it's possible for the root end to be lighter and the other end to go down. But these logs in the upright floating position would gradually sink to the bottom as they became waterlogged. And as they sink to the bottom, they're sticking in the mud. And it looks like a tree grew there when actually it was transported there by this flood. So many trees are already 15 feet deep and they're already beginning to petrify. They're going to form many layers around this because every storm or you know, seasonal change brings new layers in on top of this. And so the petrified trees in the vertical position, like we covered on video number four, are indication of rapid burial and rapid sedimentation. Same thing is happening in Mount St. Helens today. And it doesn't take long for things to petrify. We showed you how quickly things can petrify, like this pickle or things like that. Oftentimes, petrified forests, like the one in Calistoga, California, or the one in Florida, Mississippi, or in Arizona, or New Mexico, there are petrified forests all over the world. I mean, lots and lots of areas of dense petrified wood concentration. This, this picture shows a petrified tree apparently fell down and broke up into logs. When you cut a tree down for firewood, it does not automatically break up into logs for you, I can assure you. And yet these petrified forests often show this exact same feature of petrified trees that are broken up into logs. I think this indicates it petrified standing up. And then as over the next thousand years or so, the dirt washed away and it fell over and cracked, broke when it hit the ground. Here are some scuba divers about to go under the trees that are floating in Mount St. Helens. You can see the tops of their heads there in the foreground. They're going to go under and see what's happening under the trees that are floating in Spirit Lake. As the trees floated back and forth, they banged into each other and knocked all the bark off. Bark and small branches and bits of logs, and sometimes whole logs, would settle out to the bottom of Spirit Lake, making a layer of organic debris that's going to form coal. If it gets buried and conditions are right, it'll turn to coal. 